We're going to talk today just about how repeated cold exposure makes acute cold air exposure less unbearable, less uncomfortable. Some of the adaptations that go along with uh, repeated cold air exposure. So when we left off, we talked about some of the acute responses. You go out in cold air, vasoconstriction, shivering. We're talking here about the fact that, yeah, you vasoconstrict to limit hot blood flow to the periphery, but then you get this hunting response, looking for a peripheral temperature, and we call that cold-induced vasodilation. So why does this happen? What are the mechanisms behind cold-induced vasodilation? Why don't we just see a clamping off of skin blood flow and be done with it? We're glad this happens because we want to preserve the tissues. We think there's some protective function. We want it to happen, but we want to understand why. It seems that the main effect is uh, due to this bypass, this arteriovenous bypass. So at the, uh, the capillary beds in the extremities and even in, in some of the different regions of the skin, there are these little portals that can shunt blood before it gets to the capillary bed, before it gets too superficial. And if we activate these, we prevent blood flow into the capillary bed, we prevent blood flow to the fingertips or to the superficial skin, which limits it um, and keeps it inside the body. This is the pathway, the mechanics of how blood flow in the CIBD response is controlled. But what is it that closes this shunt and redirects blood flow into the capillary beds as we search for that higher finger temperature. What opens and closes that portal? And truth be told, we don't really know. We have outlined how the sympathetic nervous system is activated locally to shut off blood flow. So maybe this is a good candidate for alleviating that shutoff. Maybe there's a neural reflex at the sympathetic nervous system locally that allows vasodilation in warm tissue. And if that's the case, we should be able to make it happen. We should be able to stimulate it locally. We can activate nerves locally just with a small electrical impulse. Override the signal and allow blood flow to return. But when we do this, it only works in warm conditions. So we can artificially open up this shunt and allow blood flow to return, but it's not readily apparent in cold conditions, which is where the CIVD response happens. So why there's that limitation, we're not sure, but if that holds up, it seems that just changing the neural reflex, the axonal reflex, doesn't seem to explain why blood flow returns to the capillary bed and temperature increases. We can't make it happen in cold conditions. So if it's not the nerve closing off this shunt and then sending blood back to the capillary beds, maybe the muscles and the tissue around the capillary beds are irritated. Maybe the cold seeps in and alters metabolism and those tissues start to release local factors. This is similar to what happens with muscle at the onset of exercise. Blood flow gets shut off everywhere and then exercising muscle releases nitric oxide and some other factors that open up the capillary beds to target blood flow to where it needs to go. So why wouldn't that happen here? Maybe cold is stressful and the tissues are irritated and they release nitric oxide or endothelin-1 or some other catecholamines which have all shown vasodilatory effects. Maybe those are released and blood flow is diverted back to the tissue to warm them. But when we measure these local factors in cold exposure, there's no change. 
we don't see nitric oxide go up, endothelin-1, no catecholamines, other things on the list. There's no production of these factors by the tissues in the finger or the superficial tissues. So that can't explain why CIBD happens as well. Okay, so the nerves aren't stimulating differently. The tissues aren't releasing new factors. It's possible that the signal is ignored. Maybe the nerves aren't changing the signal they're sending. Maybe there's nothing happening locally that causes vasodilation, but maybe the tissues just get less responsive to the signal. Maybe the arterioles at the capillary beds are less responsive. And so changes in local sensitivity would allow vasodilation to occur. If the arterioles were less sensitive, less of the signal gets through, less vasoconstriction happens. Kind of like insulin sensitivity, right? If you're less sensitive to insulin, less of the signal gets through and it does less of its job taking up glucose to store. If less of the signal gets through here, the uh, sympathetic nervous system doesn't do its job as well. Less vasoconstriction happens. And we, we think this has some effect because we can modify the sensitivity of these tissues by interrupting the sympathetic nervous system. If you exercise at the same time as um, you induce the CIVD response, exercise has a way of interrupting the sympathetic nervous system. It's a big sympathetic outflow uh, as you move to exercise. And we can minimize the CIBD response. We can interrupt it. So that exercise does that means that there is some ability to change sensitivity, but we don't know what the thing is that would change sensitivity in response to cold alone. So there's possible inroads here, but we're not sure exactly <coughs> what the factor is that's causing them. But that's a, that's a potential candidate. Exercise impairs the CIVD response if we do that at the same time as we're exposed to the cold. And this kind of goes along with the idea of fatigue. So a reduced sensitivity to norepinephrine could represent fatigue at the skin or at the muscles of the fingers that allows blood flow to return. And that fatigue might, might, op or sorry, might, um, might open the capillary beds back up. They're constricted in the cold, but imagine trying to do a biceps curl with a really heavy weight and you're struggling to lift it and you can only do it for so long and your muscles fatigue and you drop the weight. Maybe something similar is happening here. Maybe the muscles that constrict the capillary beds can only do so for so long and then they fatigue. And that does happen. But if we artificially infuse norepinephrine, we can override it. So those two things together seem to suggest sensitivity is an issue, and maybe the levels of norepinephrine change, and maybe they're reduced somehow. They're not release, uh, released from the, the nervous system in has, uh, as high amounts later on during cold exposure. But if we infuse norepinephrine, we can override it. We can re-strengthen the uh, vasoconstrictory response. So something about norepinephrine release and the sensitivity of local tissues explains why blood flow alternates back and forth. It's not local factors. It's not the nervous system turning off. It's that the signal being sent is uh, registered less intensely. At least that's our understanding of it now. And we can drill down into the mechanics of this all we want to and find the right answer, but really overall, we're concerned at the whole body level with, okay, this works. What does it do to protect tissues and can we change it? Can we leverage this response in the cold? 
Is it trainable? And it is trainable. It's trainable in so far as if you are repeatedly exposed to the cold, the CIVD response happens sooner, and you get a larger increase in temperature if cold exposure persists. So if you train this response, finger temperature doesn't get as low, and then each time blood flow returns, it's higher. So that implies that this is a protective response, and we can uh, adapt to it so that if we're chronically exposed to cold, we keep our extremities warmer. So decreased time of onset, it happens sooner, a larger pulse, the deflection, the increase in temperature is larger. Instead of maybe 5 degrees, you'll see a 10 degree pulse. Can everyone train this response? If we take two groups of individuals, one that lives in the Arctic and one that uh, live in a tropical region, we see a pretty big distinction in the innate response, and that's to be expected. You're not exposed to the cold if you're in a tropical region. If you're in an Arctic region, you're almost always exposed to the cold, and so we see big differences between these two groups. What if we take these individuals and move them to an Arctic condition? Do they see a decreased onset and larger pulse? They start to, but they never get to the same level as the Arctic natives. It never happens as quickly, and they never get as large an increase in temperature with each pulse as the Arctic natives do. So the response is trainable, but there must be some genetic component from prolonged exposure and, and living at Arctic conditions that has optimized this response. Or maybe it's just that if you don't have a good CIVD response, you don't survive in the Arctic. Maybe selection's at play. We're not sure. So if you move to the cold, you don't fully adapt, at least on the order of the time courses of these studies. I think it was four to eight weeks that um, this was investigated. But maybe a longer exposure is required. Maybe generations are required uh, to fully realize that adaptation. Maybe the stimulus isn't strong enough. What if we do it in the lab? We have big control over the kind of cold exposure that you can apply to a person. Here, uh, I don't have the acclimation protocol, or sorry, the acclimatization protocol. You know the difference between those two after the midterm. Lab protocol to test the adaptability of this response is four index finger immersions per day, hour each, four times per day, over one month. So that's a pretty extreme stimulus. We observe the same, the same kind of response, incomplete adaptation when we compare to our Arctic norms. It does speed up, the pulse is larger, but it can never fully explain the best response that we observe in Arctic natives. So maybe we just need a larger intervention. Maybe we need more than four immersions per day over a month. Maybe we need a colder temperature. To what end? Is that reasonable? Is that ethical? Who is going to want to put themselves through that? And does that warrant such an intervention? Is is a CIVD response, an enhancement of the CIVD response, so desirable that you'd be willing to put yourself through that on a daily basis over the course of a month? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe it's in preparation for an Arctic expedition. We're not sure. What does the CIVD response do for us? What does it do for us? We can answer that question in understanding how it relates to some of the injuries we talked about earlier in class. We can measure the CIVD response and different characteristics to understand what the individual risk is uh, of frostbite. And this is a highly repeatable, generally reliable method of predicting whether you are going to 
um, experience injury in the cold? What characteristics will allow us to calculate that? Three main factors. If you do the CIVD response uh, that I showed you on the trace, there are three things that you can measure that have actual numbers that you score versus what are normal responses. And combined, they give you the resistance index of frostbite, or RIF score. If the value is worse than a population average, you score a 1. If it's the same as a population average, you score a 2. If it's better than the average, you score a 3. You can have then a score between 3 and 9 when you measure mean temperature, minimum temperature, and then the onset time for the CIVD response. Three factors, each are scored one to three, and you combine those points together to get a final score of three to nine. Three being poor and very high likelihood of frostbite, nine being highly resistant to frostbite and injury is unlikely. And if we do this calculation, we see the correlation pretty plainly. There are some genetic differences, not only um, in Arctic versus tropical natives, but Caucasians have a higher RIF score than non-Caucasians, seemingly. This is uh, in a group of Dutch soldiers that went on an Arctic expedition, and we measured their adaptation over time. Still an incomplete adaptation, but their individual RIF scores were inversely proportional to the pain they felt in exposure to the cold. Just the pain of your face being cold or rewarming afterwards, that sensation of pain, which is highly individualized, was a lot lower with a higher RIF score. Interesting. These are in a non habitual uh, cold, uh, these are in individuals that don't often experience cold, we'll put it that way. So what might this look like if we measure each of these three factors and then score on a three-point scale combined to make nine points? Let's take a look at the trace. We can see where onset time is uh, listed here from the beginning of exposure to when we see the first upswing in finger temperature. The minimum temperature would be how low this deflection occurred. The minimum point, actually it's over here, the minimum point where the deflection um, landed on the temperature scale, and then the mean temperature would be the average highest and lowest temperature throughout the CIVD exposure. So let's say that you have a really good response. You're training your CIVD response for an Arctic expedition. What we would expect to happen is that your normal response would happen sooner, and that Minimum finger temperature would be higher. Mean temperature would also be higher. So the onset time is shown here with this dashed line. You can see it's, it's moved to the left in comparison to this gray bar. The mean finger temperature shown by this horizontal dashed line. The minimum temperature shown by the bottom of the shaded green box. Overall, these are all scored better than a normal response as opposed to individuals that habitually live in a tropical climate that never have to do this, a lower RIF score would have a longer onset time, a lower minimum temperature, a lower mean temperature, resulting in corresponding RIF scores of 9 in the green case, 3 in the orange case. And it can look different. You might have only one of the three elements that's better. Maybe the onset time is really good, but your fingers get really cold, and your RIF score might be four or five. That's possible too. But these highlight the extremes. Really, really good, really poor, the extremes of our RIF scale. The individuals in green would have lower pain sensations and more resistance to frostbite than the individuals in orange. Now, I don't want to throw these up to confuse the issue because we have packaged, uh, packaged it up pretty nicely, I think. 
understanding the CIVD response. It has a cryoprotective uh, function. You can train it, it gets faster, temperature stays higher. You can train it with cold exposure. But it's not packaged so nicely as that when you consider that all of these factors change the CIVD response. If your body temperature is higher, CIVD response is better. You have more body heat to draw on, and so maybe you can distribute it to the core more easily. For that matter, if you measure the CIVD response in summer, it's better than in winter, in the same person. If you acclimatize, you have a more robust CIVD response that we just talked about, faster onset, higher minimum temperature, higher mean temperature. Altitude reduces the CIVD response for some reason. Cold exposure at altitude then would blunt the CIVD response even more, which is unfortunate. And in looking for some countermeasures, diet's always a place that we look for countermeasures. There are some effects of vitamin C, oddly enough, which suggests that maybe this response has to do with the production of free radicals locally. We talked about cold tissue being irritated and then producing those free radicals. Vitamin C quenches free radicals. It's an antioxidant. And so maybe supplementation with vitamin C can have some benefit to preserving or promoting the CIVD response in the cold. Um, you generally stay hotter if you have a lot of protein. The thermic effect of food, of a high-protein diet, makes your body temperature higher. And I didn't put it on here, but uh, ingestion of 45 grams of sodium per day also seems to improve the CI, uh, CIVD response. 45 grams of sodium is 45,000 milligrams, which I think seems pretty irresponsible. So I don't want to tout that message for you, considering the, the RDA for sodium is in the 2,000s to 2,500 milligram range. Maybe in the cold, maybe, maybe with exercise, something like this is achievable or required, but it seems pretty irresponsible when given that high sodium intakes are related to hypertension and coronary artery disease. But there's some inroads here where diet can affect the CIBD response as well. Lastly, I just want to point out that if you've ever been in a situation where you've sustained a cold injury, unfortunately, for the rest of your life, the CIVD response isn't completely, well, depending on the injury, it might be completely abolished, but it's certainly desensitized and blunted. So previous frostbite reduces the likelihood that you will be resistant to frostbite in future kind of propagates a vicious cycle where cold exposure begets cold exposure begets cold exposure. Maybe that's why we're underscoring the importance of CIVD and staying warm in this section. Don't let it um, get out of control from the onset. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <coughs> what can we do? To prevent cold exposure, to boost the CIVD response, what other countermeasures can we have other than what's shown here? We can change our diet, we can acclimatize and train, we could be hotter, we could not have been cold injured in the past. The being hotter idea is really what we're leveraging when talking about different countermeasures to maintain and enhance the CIVD response. And it's what we do already anyway. It's you, you wear multiple layers. You wear a big, thick, heavy... Canada Goose Jacket when you go outside. Passive insulation is a fantastic countermeasure to maintain body heat, which allows it to be diverted to the periphery to keep those tissues warm as well. But in some extreme cases, that's not enough. Passive insulation is great, but there's still a gradient to the environment. You still get cold if you're in your heavy jacket for a while outside. So in those extreme conditions, you can adopt a more active form of insulation, like this jacket here, which is uh, a warming jacket that you connect to your cell phone that has a, a heater inside, kind of like an electric blanket that you wear. 
So an active electrical uh, jacket, or you can use, some have phase change material. You'll see that in those uh, heater inserts you put in your gloves when you go skiing. I don't know what the actual chemical reaction is, but you break the little pack inside and they get really hot and release heat. That's a chemical countermeasure to, uh, to stave off the cold. So if you do something like that, let's say you're going skiing and you put those inserts in your mitts, is that better to maintain manual function and keep your fingers warm than warming your torso? Should you wear this jacket that heats your torso or should you wear gloves with warm inserts in them? Maybe you're doing both. That's probably the best case scenario. But is there a benefit to doing one or the other? It'd be nice if the, the glove inserts were good enough because they're pretty cheap, they're small, you can buy and replace them easily. The, this type of jacket I think costs about 200 US, which actually isn't that expensive when you think about it. Um, you have to make sure that you always keep it charged or plugged in or it drains your phone in order to power it. Uh, are you gonna be able to maintain a power supply over a multi-hour expedition? Is it possible to fix it if any of the cords are damaged? Um, is it just a paperweight? Is it going to catch on fire while you're wearing it? There's pros and cons to each. But um, if we compare directly hand warming versus torso warming, here shown over three hours, there's not a whole lot of difference between the two, but we can glean a few uh, tidbits of information that might suggest one over the other at the end of three hours. So what we're looking at here are a heated vest, like we saw on the last slide in the solid circles. And in most cases, that's the line on top. We're looking in the top at uh, finger temperature, and we have finger blood flow in the bottom. So this is, in effect, the CIVD response. Blood flow bringing hot blood back to the, the fingers to maintain their temperature. And we're comparing torso heating with the heated vest to gloves in the open circles. In most cases, that's the lower line uh, on each graph. Now the comparison we're making isn't just temperature or flow. We're looking to see whether dexterity is affected. And this is in the cold with um, exposure during these breaks. Dexterity test one and dexterity test two and I forget the specifics, but it's removing the gloves and having to affect some small, uh, to manipulate some small nuts and bolts and measure um, being able to move these items quickly. It's, a, it's a, a test to make sure that manual function isn't compromised. And importantly, the hands are exposed. It's in the cold, which is why temperature drops so sharply in both groups. So we have dexterity test one, dexterity test two, spaced out over the course of three hours. And in both cases, gloves or the vest do a pretty good job at maintaining dexterity despite what looks like a slightly lower blood flow in finger two in test two. So what this says is that it seems that at least on the short term, you can warm either. The gloves are fine if you're skiing. You can wear a heated vest if you want to. Both work well to maintain manual function, but this reduced blood flow is concerning. And it's concerning because what happens when you get into hour four or hour five or hour 12? We haven't measured it, we're not sure, but this implies a progressive reduction in blood flow, which you can only imagine will widen the gap up here and compromise dexterity eventually. Both work well over three hours, and maybe surprisingly, I would hypothesize if you drew this out that warming the torso would be a more effective strategy for longer duration exposure, which makes sense. Body temperature is what supplies hot blood to the skin. If you have more of a furnace internally, perhaps there's a greater ability to maintain blood flow and dexterity than with just hand warming alone. Um, I've had students ask before as well, this is a, a common countermeasure of interest. People say alcohol makes you feel warmer in the cold. Cold exposure, you drink 
alcohol, you're out drinking at a football game or who knows what, it's, uh, it's late fall, there's a brisk cold wind outside, and you feel warmer, right? Your hands are warmer. Isn't that a good countermeasure to stay warm in the cold? The answer, unfortunately, is no. Your hands do feel warmer, but it's because alcohol vasodilates everything. It sends all the hot blood back to the skin, so it eliminates the CIVD response. To the touch, your hand feels warmer, but all of the hot blood is able to lose body heat. It's bad long term because you're just leaching body heat off to the environment. So it abolishes the CIVD response, and while you feel warmer to the touch, you lose that heat much more quickly. And so long term, a bad countermeasure to, to stay warm in the cold. All right, so vasoconstriction, we've covered that. It's modified. It helps to maintain tissue function. What about shivering? If core body temperature is so important, if heating the torso better preserves the CIVD response, well, how could we boost body temperature? Shivering is how we can boost body temperature. Shivering creates more heat than would naturally be present in the cold. And we do that through this asynchronous, intermittent contraction of muscles. We decouple movement from metabolism. Normally, it's really hard to disengage those two. If the muscles are active, you're doing work, right? Shivering is a response where you start to activate the muscle and then shut it off and turn it on, and shut it off, and turn it on, and shut it off, so you get the benefit of metabolism happening without having to do work. Shivering is a response, or um, in response primarily, to really cold skin. Skin is the first line of defense. Skin temperature is what stimulates shivering, and we know this because as you step into a cold room, you start to shiver early before your body gets cold, before core temperature drops too far. So there hasn't been time yet for core body temperature to drop. The skin senses the cold seeping in and initiates the shivering response to preempt a large drop in body temperature. And depending on how cold the skin gets, and maybe it's not even an absolute number. Maybe it's measuring the flow of heat, like we talked about in the thermoregulatory section. Maybe it's the gradient that we're sensing and integrating in the brain. If the gradient is really small, we can start with small contractions and engage small muscles and generate enough heat to be content. It's not a problem. And the kind of contraction we're talking about is only single digit percents of the maximal voluntary contraction. So think about your 1RM doing a bench press or doing a squat or doing a biceps curl. That's the maximal voluntary contraction and you're doing one to four percent of that work in these light, small contractions. If the gradient is larger, the response is larger. We can add large muscle groups we can prog uh, progress from just a small shudder to really violent shivering. 5 to 16% of your maximum voluntary contraction that can produce up to 500 watts of heat energy. The largest shivering response that I've ever found was 763 watts of heat energy in 12 degrees Celsius water, which is the equivalent of if you were on a bike and you exercised at about 150 watts. That's a modest exercise intensity for some individuals. 45, 50% of VO2 max in some cases. That's a pretty stout energetic supply or energetic demand. The amount of shivering or the amount of energy generated by shivering can uh, at maximum uh, be about that high, which roughly equates to about one liter per minute if you're measuring VO2.
So the, the caloric requirements can be fairly large. This is almost like exercise in severe cases. Some people will voluntarily expose themselves to the cold to help leverage the wasting of energy to promote dieting, to waste energy, lose weight, etc. Not, not a good practice necessarily, but we can get pretty large energy expenditures with pretty violent contractions and uh, pretty cold conditions. How do we supply shivering? It's really not unlike any muscle contraction. Shivering is just what would happen if you exercised but without doing the exercise. We can measure the substrates that are used for shivering pretty accurately. We know it's carbohydrate dependent. It prefers carbohydrate. And maybe that's just because during metabolism, carbohydrate is a more efficient fuel. You get more energy per liter of O2, which in this case means more heat for the amount of energy consumed. But we can use fats if, uh, if carbohydrate's unavailable, if glycogen is unavailable, and we can measure that switch between the two. We don't know what the efficiency is per se, even though I just mentioned that it's probably similar to actual exercise. There's no reason to believe that it's not different than actual exercise because it's the same musculature, the same pathways that are active. It's just disengaged from the end result. So there are some implications here for how you might experience shivering in the wild. Carbohydrate, a big energy source for shivering. We talked about the, uh, the whole body exposure to cold on Arctic type expeditions. In the field, insomnia, sometimes poor diet, really long exercise, uh, stress as well as cold exposure can all contribute to perhaps hypoglycemia. And being that shivering relies mainly on carbohydrates, and yeah, I can switch to lipids, hypoglycemia can severely limit the shivering response, which is the last thing that you want if you are stressed in the cold miles away from civilization, right? Hypoglycemia, this is blood glucose concentration, so very low. You know, it should be around 5 millimolar, maybe 4 to 5. Reduces the, shri uh, the shivering threshold. So this allows body temperature to drop more, allows skin temperature to drop more. And 0.5 degrees doesn't sound like a large drop when you're considering that the narrow range of survivability or the preferred range is plus or minus 1 degree Celsius. That's a fairly large deflection. So hypoglycemia allows a much larger drop before shivering is initiated, perhaps to spare carbohydrate. And so the logical conclusion then is if you're in the field on a long expedition, if you are exercising in the cold, some kind of competition lasting a couple hours, there's a rationale and maybe even more of a rationale than just participating in exercise to supplement with carbohydrates. Gels, sports drinks, high carb meals beforehand, carbohydrate loading, tapering. Because not only are you using that energy to supply exercise, but if you're cold and the shivering response is required, you're using carbohydrate for that as well. So let's get a, a relative indication of the types of substrate use, the quantities of fuel use in each of these conditions. We're looking at the top at uh, moderate exercise, 70% of VO2 max or VO2 peak. This is a moderate to high exercise intensity. And as you would expect, there's a, a division, a split in carbohydrates and fat used to sustain that exercise. There's a pretty large proportion of fat at this type of intensity. This is on the higher end of what you've classically considered the fat burning zone. 60 to 70 percent is where you get your highest contribution from fat. But uh, it's not exclusively driven by fat. There's also a large component coming from carbohydrate. But these two things supply the exercise demands at 70 percent VO2 peak. 
Now, in comparison to exercise, and I want to point out before we move on, these are percent contributions. So this might be 55% of the energy um, needed to sustain exercise comes from carbohydrate. 45% comes from fat. They're percent contributions. In comparison to exercise, if you're intensely shivering, you also get about 45% of that energy from carbohydrate, 40-45% from fat. Compare that to low-intensity shivering, so just a mild shudder, I'm moderately uncomfortable, I'm slightly cold. In a normal situation, these are both somewhat reduced. If I have lots of glycogen on hand, you can see that I prefer to use carbohydrates to sustain that low-intensity shivering. If I have low glycogen, maybe after a multi-day expedition or many days of training during a training camp, I, uh, I end up switching over to use a larger proportion of, uh, of lipids to supply that shivering response. But it's, it's only percent contribution. We have no idea of what the, the absolute amount of energy is. So exercise here might require 1,000 kcals. Shivering probably doesn't require 1,000 kcals. The percentages look similar, but the total energy requirement is probably a lot lower. So make sure to understand these aren't direct one-to-one -one comparisons. These are just percentages. Main point to take away from this figure is the gradual shift in substrates as you change the availability of carbohydrate. If you have lots, you'll use it for shivering. If you have little, you use fat for shivering. Imagine, I should have probably drawn just two triangles over top of these bars. Notice the progressive increase in fat contribution as you go to a low glycogen state and the reduction in carbohydrate oxidation. I also find it pretty interesting that there must have been some protein right? Macronutrients to support metabolism, protein, fat, carbs. Metabolism should be entirely supported by all of those three macronutrients. I've got about 50% from fat in the low glycogen, light shivering case, maybe 30% from uh, carbohydrates. That total is about 85% of shivering supported by those two macronutrients. We're missing 15%. Got to come from protein. Kind of interesting to note that. Or the measurements were wrong. We're not sure. So, shivering produces energy. Shivering uses carbohydrate. If you don't have any on hand, you can use fat. What else can you do to boost body heat production? And this is a really interesting concept, this idea of non-shivering thermogenesis. The name implies you generate heat through means that are not shivering related. It's not the intermittent contraction of muscle. It's not engaging more muscles and disengaging locomotion. There's something that happens in tissues when you are repeatedly exposed to the cold that naturally increases their metabolic rate. And that's what we're talking about here. This non-shivering thermogenesis is uh, a higher metabolic rate. It's wasting the energy that you have on hand in the cell. Normally, from an evolutionary perspective, this is terrible. You never want to waste energy. What if you run out? What if there's a famine situation? You never want to waste energy. It's only recently that we've had a surplus and this can be leveraged. What we're talking about when we think of wasting energy is specifically in the mitochondria. You go through all this effort to make that gradient to make ATP. And you try to keep that gradient as best you can, but this is a saboteur. We're sabotaging that gradient. We're wasting the energy uh, that we would normally use to make ATP.
This system is all dependent on losing that proton gradient. And I'll show you what that looks like on the next slide. It's really bad for being able to do work, but it's really good for keeping you warm. You, you still uh, engage metabolism fully, but all that work is undone at the mitochondria. So you get all the benefits of the heat generation of metabolism, and then it's undone at the mitochondria, which allows it to continue. Really bad to do work, great for um, using, or great for generating heat, and the potential exists that we can use this to treat a chronic energy surplus. And what condition is described or characterized by a chronic energy surplus? Obesity, obesity related diseases, diabetes, insulin resistance coronary artery uh, disease, etc., may or may not be um, a therapeutic target of this type of treatment. This is the response uh, that is localized to that special tissue I mentioned at the start of the section. Brown adipose tissue is not common. It does exist in humans. We can turn it on. We can train it a little bit. But this is a very special, metabolically active fat. Normally, fat is largely a storage depot. It also releases some endocrine molecules that communicates with the rest of the body. But this type of fat uses a lot of energy. So if we can make a lot of this fat, we have the capacity or the potential to use or expend a lot of energy. And the big difference in brown adipose tissue is that it has a really high density of mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell. Normal white adipose doesn't, brown adipose does, which implies it can have a pretty high metabolic rate. Now what that means, we're not sure. Fat's certainly not contracting. There's no muscle, there's no contractile apparatus that needs energy. But it's there for a reason, and if we can leverage that to help treat an energy surplus, why not? Brown adipose tissue, really interesting tissue. We don't have very much. It's mostly kind of in the neck region. Um, it seems to be more active in women than in men, which is interesting, and uh, it's somewhat trainable but it's also less active in people with a really high body fat, which seems counterintuitive. You'd think there'd be more in people with a high body fat. And the brown fat that's there doesn't work as well. Shoot themselves in the foot, which is kind of unfortunate. So this uh, describes the, um, the phenomenon that we're talking about. So this is the mitochondria, the inner membrane and the outer membrane. The cell is the front wall of the room. And this might be a muscle cell or a brown uh, adipocyte. We're not sure. The process of non-shivering thermogenesis is described here. So in a normal situation, this is what we do. Pump protons out in the electron transport chain. You remember the electron transport chain. We're not going to go into it in depth, but that's the whole job. Transport electrons, pump protons out. So we have a lot out here. We have very few inside, and that allows us to harness the gradient. As protons move back in from high to low concentration, we couple that movement with the creation of ATP. We make energy, and that's good. That's really good for task for, uh, performance. That's how we've evolved and thrived as a species. But the process of non-shivering thermogenesis describes a bypass. Instead of that gradient um, being harnessed to make energy, in non-shivering thermogenesis, we uh, just waste the gradient. We open up a hole in the membrane. Protons pass through. They still follow the gradient from high to low, but they don't do anything as they pass back into the mitochondria.
And so these proteins are of pretty high interest in this field. These are uncoupling proteins, UCPs. There are a number of them, UCP1, UCP2, UCP3. Some of them are in fat, some of them are in the liver, some of them are in muscle. Some of them can be um, induced with exercise. Some of them can be induced with cold training. The idea being, if you have more of them, there's a greater ability to waste the gradient. There's a greater ability to generate heat and not do work. So if we can make more of these proteins, this is the protein of interest in treating obesity. If there was a pill that would make more of these proteins pop up in the membrane, you'd waste the gradient, metabolism would be running outside of the cell, full steam ahead, you'd be using lots of energy, but you wouldn't have to exercise. The exercise pill. Fortunately, all attempts to do this have killed people. Uncoupling proteins are really, um, there's a lot of other roles that they have in the cell. If you just blanket induce these, you can imagine, if you get rid of the gradient altogether, that's pretty bad. You need the gradient in order to survive. You need ATP in order to survive. Uh, if you don't have any ATP, it's, that's one of the characteristics of death. Rigor, rigor mortis, when you run out of ATP and your muscles freeze, bad to run out of ATP. So if you have too many of these, pretty severe consequences. Um... That's the idea of non-shivering thermogenesis. We're going to look at how we can induce this response, how much it gets turned on, if we can leverage it uh, to help with obesity, if we can leverage it to help maintain core body temperature. In this section coming up as we look at the chronic adaptations to cold exposure. So quick break. We only have, what, 20 minutes left in class. Let's do a couple minutes. We'll come back and introduce this concept before uh, we call it for the day.